Thanks uh, to the LEAF staff for inviting me. Uh, I'm excited to present my work uh, today. So there's going to be two parts to my talk. The first is I'm going to talk about uh, the microbiome and its role in muscle strength. But then as a second part, I'm going to get into my own uh, biomarker data as this is the biomarker uh, section. So let's get into it. All right, so the gut microbiome has been implicated in uh, the health and functioning of almost every tissue in the body. Uh, in the brain, it's been linked with autism, stress and stroke. In the lung, it's been linked with, with asthma. In the liver, uh, with non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, with uh, atopic dermatitis in the skin. Uh, it's been linked with adipo adipose tissue inflammation and, and uh, obesity. And uh, in terms of the whole body, type 2 diabetes, lupus, uh, malnourishment, and uh, atherosclerosis. So if you'll notice on this uh, review from three years ago, uh, a glaring absence of a link between the gut microbiome with muscle, with skeletal muscle. So um, last year, we published uh, a role for the emerging gut, gut microbiome muscle axis. Uh, so what does that entail? So briefly, we uh, summarized findings mostly in rodents with very few studies done in older adults. Uh, so what does it entail? So with age, there is uh, uh, an alteration in the composition of the gut microbiome and increases in intestinal permeability. This results in an increase in circulating microbial products. In this case, we highlighted endotoxin. Endotoxin has been shown to negatively impact muscle size. And alternatively, there, there are uh, data in pigs that have shown a role for the uh, gut microbiome on influencing the amount of fat within muscle, and that's important because with age, there's actually more fat in muscle where it shouldn't be and less muscle. Um, so collectively, that suggests a role for the gut microbiome on size and composition, which negatively, negatively impact muscle function, thereby leading to loss of independence and reduced quality of life. So as I mentioned, most of these data are in rodents. So uh, uh, we decided to do a study in older adult humans looking at the role of the gut microbiome on uh, body composition and physical function in older adult humans. So um, we ended up uh, having a small study uh, designated as HF, high functioning, and LF, low functioning. Uh, these groups were uh, balanced for uh, 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 sex, gender, uh, percent female, not different in terms of age, not different in terms of BMI, but the high functioning group, as expected, had a better body composition, about 5% leaner whole body lean mass, 5% uh, less whole body fat mass, no difference in uh, bone mineral content. And then again, as expected, um, different in terms of physical function, so the high functioning older adults uh, had higher, uh, a short physical performance battery test, which involves a test of balance, four meter gait speed, and a chair stand test. Uh, their 400 meter gait speed was faster, and then they had uh, stronger muscle strength relative to the lower functioning group. So the, the most obvious question is, are there gut microbiome differences between these two groups of older adults? So what I'm showing here is the average family level uh, relative abundance for the low functioning group and for the high functioning group at a baseline visit. So I won't get into all of the differences, but the one that I want to highlight just for now are Prevotella, which I've boxed here, and they were lower in the low functioning group and higher, actually twofold higher in the uh, high functioning group. And this was the, the strongest, uh, you know, it, bacterial group that was highest in relative abundance. I mean, you can see differences that are like 0.2% versus 0.06%, but is that really going to make an impact on, potentially, on body composition and physical function? Uh, Prevotella here, we're about 8% of the total bacteria found in the uh, uh, stool, whereas uh, in the low functioning group, it was about 4%. So, all right, so uh, whereas identification of, asso of associations at one time point are, uh, is an important observation, we decided to test the reprodu reproducibility of that finding by having our subjects come back a month later and then resampling their gut microbiome and looking at their, uh, at the associations between the gut microbiome between the two groups. So uh, there's the Prevotella differences at the baseline visit, and once again, they were also different at the uh, one-month visit. So this would more strongly suggest a role for Prevotella uh, being involved, potentially being involved in uh, any mechanisms related to body composition and or physical function. I just want to note, too, that we saw a few other changes. Uh, so S24-7 at the family level were different between the two groups. Genus level Prevotella and Barnesiella, and the bacterial species Barnesiella intestinal hominis were different between these two groups uh, at both study visits. 
So associations are nice, but we want to get at causation. So essentially, one of the ways for testing uh, causation in microbiome studies is by fecal transfer into animals that don't have a microbiome, germ-free mice. Um, so how did we do that? So we took six uh, fecal samples from the high-functioning group, uh, three males and three females, and six fecal samples from the low-functioning group, again, three and three, and then we transplanted them into young germ-free mice. So they start off, they don't have a microbiome, and then when, we, when you transplant the fecal samples, then they should have the microbiome uh, that is similar to where it came from. Uh, so then we waited a month, uh, and then did we get high-functioning mice, and do we have low-functioning low mice that correspond to where they came from, high func uh, HF into HF and LF, do we get LF mice? So the first step in uh, this process would be identifying bacteria that are different in the human fecal donors and potentially that are also different in their respectively colonized mice. And then as the second step, did we actually see differences in body composition or physical function uh, in the mice? So we saw a whole bunch of bacteria that were different when comparing the human fecal donors and their respectively colonized mice. So I've got that on the left here, human fecal donors uh, and their human microbiome uh, containing mice. So at every taxonomic level, we saw some differences, phylic class order, family genus species. But what I want to point out is that uh, the strongest data for a role of the gut microbiome on potentially body composition or physical function, at least from my perspective, would be different in the larger human group, different in the smaller human fecal donor group, and then also different in the uh, mice that were colonized with fecal samples from the HF and or LF uh, uh, older adults. So just to uh, highlight those bacteria, Prevotellaceae, uh, Barnesiella, Prevotella, and Barnesiella intestinal hominis satisfy all of those criteria. They're big, uh, different in the bigger group, the smaller hu human fecal donor group, and also in the mice. So different in the donors and also different in the microbiome containing mice. So if there is going to be a role for the microbiome on body comp or physical function, I would suspect that these would potentially be the big players. So then the big news is, did we actually see any differences in body composition or physical function in the colonized mice? So uh, we, for, for each fecal donor, we transplanted that into three germ-free mice. So essentially it's, it's uh, triplicate per sample. So since we had six human fecal donors per group, that means we had 18 mice colonized with fecal samples from older adults from the HF and LF. They're matched for sex, so nine and nine. And then, interestingly, we did not see differences in uh, body composition. So, uh, whereas the uh, larger group had about 5% differences in body composition, the fecal donors were even more different. They were 10% different, so 10% uh, differences, 10% uh, more lean, and 10% less fat mass in the, when comparing the human fecal donors. So this was actually a surprise. Um, and then, uh, so as two measures of function, we ran mice exhaustion on a treadmill, and actually they were not different. This was also a surprise. But then interestingly, we saw a small but significant effect in grip strength. Uh, so the high functioning colonized mice actually had 6% higher grip strength when compared with the lower functioning group. So with all of these uh, data in mind, because of the overlap between these bacteria, are they involved in mechanisms related to muscle strength in older adults? So I wish I had that data. Uh, that's the next step, one of the next steps, is testing that hypothesis. Um, so. Uh, what I've shown you is that we uh, performed the microbiome-wide association study, including cross-sectional and a brief longitudinal study, and then with outcome measures including body comp and physical function, and with microbiome compositional uh, profiling and with multivariate linkage, we identified a few candidate uh, bacteria that may be involved in the maintenance of uh, body composition and or physical function. So then to test causation, we reproduced these uh, uh, fecal samples into germ-free mice, uh, and again, identified that similar bacterial pattern. So what would be a next step? It, again, as I mentioned, is performing the interventional study. So if we transplant these ba specific bacteria into germ-free mice, do we get an increase in muscle mass? That, that would be the expectation. Uh, and then alternatively, if we do a resistance training protocol aimed at increasing muscle strength in older adult humans, do we see corresponding differences in uh, muscle strength? Uh, and then if so, how? The next step would be to also test mechanisms. So uh, second part of my talk, I'm going to get into some of my biomarker data. And uh, for those of you who have, haven't seen me talk before or uh, seen my, my writings, uh, it's my goal to live longer than anyone that's ever lived before, 122. And uh, I intend on using uh, every bit of the best available science uh, to get there. So uh, 
I'd like to say I'm not intending to wait for sentence to help me 50 years from now or 20 years from now, so I'm doing what I can do now. So what am I doing? So biological processes underline the uh, balance between uh, health, disease, and lifespan. So can it be slowed? So uh, I think it can be slowed. So I'm using blood testing as a uh, snapshot of systemic health with the idea that regular tracking can catch deviations from health sooner rather than later, which would be expected to potentially ex extend health and lifespan. So what do I track? So uh, I track the metabolic panel plus uh, uh, CBC, the uh, standard blood chemistry screen, and it uh, comprises of everything on this list. So uh, fasting glucose, markers of uh, kidney function, including uric acid, bun, creatinine, uh, electrolytes and minerals, markers of liver function, lipid profile, and the complete blood count, including you know, red blood cells, hemoglobin, hematocrit, white blood cells, and the differentials, platelets. So why have I decided to focus on the metabolic panel plus CBC? It's been heavily studied for a very long time. Uh, in contrast to the human genome, which was sequenced less than 20 years ago, meaning there's less than 20 years of data on genetic risk. In contrast, the, the markers on the metabolic panel plus CBC have been heavily studied for at least 60 to 100 plus years. So knowing how these things change with age and knowing if they're associated with increased mortality risk, you can, you can start to put together a framework for where your biomarker should be, or at least I can, uh, book coming later at some point on that, but uh, where they should be during aging. And it's also a relatively cheap test, $35. So you can repeat it, you know, do repeated measures and not bankrupt, yeah, get bankrupted. So uh, I don't have to go into this data, uh, th uh, thanks to the Insilico crew, but uh, they published two papers using the, a, the machine learning uh, approach to develop the blood biomarker panel that was predictive of biological age. And this is uh, freely available, aging.ai. And uh, it includes 19 blood test parameters. All of them are comprised on that CBC, that $35 blood test, with a relatively strong correlation to predict uh, biological age. So what's my biological age? So uh, as I mentioned, there are 19 variables, and I've put them all up here. If anyone wants to uh, double check my math and go to the site and see if I actually get the results that I, that I get. And I don't want to uh, put anybody on blast, but I've heard David Sinclair talk about how his biological age puts him in the 30s or biologically in the 30s, and I haven't seen any data. So here's data. Um, and based on all these data, my biological age is 29, a little over 29 years old. So how old am I actually? My chronological age is, I'm 46 right now. So <laughs> it's good now, but check back in in 50 years. So, so uh, but it's still, it still is going to be even better by then. So, uh, so I'm a third younger, at least biologically, relative to my chronological age. So how am I able to do this? Um, so hacking biological age, and I'm not necessarily a fan of the word hacking because I think it's a word that non-scientists use, but nonetheless, uh, if I'm going to hack biological age, I need to know the components that are most important in determining the biological age. So Dr. Zhu already presented this uh, aging.ai feature importance plot, and I usually throw out a question, you know, which, which biomarker do you think is most predictive for biological age, but he already uh, gave away the, the million dollar question which is uh, albumin, serum levels of uh, albumin, which is a protein produced by the liver. So um, optimizing serum levels of al albumin are probably a pretty good place to start for optimizing biological age, or if that's your goal. So to optimize it, you've got to know first how it changes during age. So the reference range is 35 to 50 grams per liter. But what's optimal? I mean, when you go and get a blood test, you'll get the reference range, but you've got to know how does it change with age What's its association or involvement in, in uh, mortality risk? So I'm just going to show the aging data. So, uh, so what we can see here is, uh, and this is in a large study. I know the uh, Dr. Zhu presented data from in silico, but this is data from a, a mil more than a million subjects. Um, uh, so albumin levels peak uh, late teens in both males and females, and then slowly decline with age. And in support of these data, centenarians have values in separate studies, 35-ish grams per liter. So uh, I buy this data. A million subjects is very, it's a big group. So uh, what are my values? Now, uh, prior to about the last four years, I was just tracking my blood once a year, just going to my GP and getting my blood test results and just logging them into an Excel file. So I'm going to show that data first. And uh, based on that data, I was at about 47 grams per liter here, when technically, based on chronological age, I should have been somewhere around here. 
So even, even in my 30s, I was still uh, biologically younger than my chronological age. But what's interesting is that about four years ago, I started tracking my diet, weighing all my food, and uh, recording a, about 50 different dietary variables. And um, with the goal of further optimizing my circulating biomarkers. So what's happened since then? So I've actually gotten my albumin to go up during that time. And these are the blood test results that I've done over the three to four periods since I started tracking my diet. So even though, and, and that those, those two values, before tracking and after tracking, are statistically significant. So uh, even though I should be on this downward slope, I've actually gotten even further off the chart. So at least for now, I'm resisting the age-related decline in albumin levels. So how am I doing it? So as I mentioned, I, I use daily dietary tracking. And what I do is, and this is the very rudimentary approach, I'm just using simple correlations between all my dietary variables. And uh, oh, I, oh, I should introduce that a little better. So I have uh, a bunch of blood test results, and I have a dietary period that matches those blood test results. So for example, if I do my blood test in June, and then again in August, I have the period from June to August, uh, the average dietary period that corresponds to that blood test. And because I have so many blood tests, I can start to have average dietary pattern with a given blood test result. And with enough data, in this case I have you know, 13 to 17 blood test results that correspond with 13 average dietary patterns. So I can start to look for correlations between the diet with my blood test stuff. So, uh, I identify significant correlations between my diet with the blood test, and then uh, modify my diet if, if uh, I need to, and then did albumin or other selected biomarkers improve? And if it didn't, try something else. So just as a brief intro of my uh, dietary tracking, what do I track? I track uh, both macronutrients, you know, uh, carbohydrates, fiber, uh, individual fats, omega-3, omega-6, protein, percent protein but also uh, micronutrients, uh, B vitamins, cholesterol, uh, vitamin A and its metabolites, vitamin A, uh, C, D, E, and K, and then uh, uh, all the minerals. So why is this important? So, and also which dietary variable was most significantly correlated with albumin? How have I been able to keep my albumin very high and resisting that age-related decline? So what's interesting is that the strongest association for all, of, all these variables was for beta carotene. And uh, so again, each individual data point corresponds to an average dietary intake, which in this case, the strongest correlation between the average dietary intake with albumin ended up being for beta carotene. Uh, now, you could say R equals the, the correlation coefficient being 0.71 isn't very strong, but that was the strongest data I had for this. Um, so how do I get 55,000 micrograms or 55 milligrams of beta carotene to approximately correlate to this uh, very high level of albumin. Well, beta carotene is found in carrots. So to get that much beta carotene, I purposefully eat a lot of carrots, about a pound or more a day. So if you see me munching on carrots, now you know why. Uh, so challenges. So uh, the effect of diet on biomarkers is clearly going to be multifactorial. It's not a perfect system, and I, know, I understand I'm using simple correlations, or in some cases, multivariable uh, regression models. Uh, but it, those may not be the best to capture trends in the data. So machine learning was previously used to predict uh, biological age, and the vision that I have, uh, at least for my own stuff, is to use uh, machine learning um, to develop an algorithm that integrate, integrates diet and biomarkers, but even better would be uh, taking my host genome, the microbiome, environmental exposure, physical activity, sleep, all the variables you can think of that could possibly affect our biological age and then uh, have the machine learning al algorithm come up with the, the, the scheme that best optimizes that. And if anyone here wants to help, help me with that, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm all ears and always available. And then just, uh, just as a last uh, quick shameless plug, I've just uh, as a book, uh, I've got a book online right now, Microbial Burden, a Major Cause of Aging and uh, Age-Related Disease. One limitation of the SENS approach, sorry Aubrey, is I don't see any role for microbes on impacting all the major damage. I actually have a, a pretty relatively big section on my book that shows a role for microbial burden, whether that's microbes and or their microbial products being in places they shouldn't be, blood, brain, uh, liver, wherever, on all of the hallmarks of aging. And this is an underreported story that, that uh, you don't hear about very much. So, and uh, like I said, I'm easily accessible by all these different places, so uh, that's all I have, and thanks for your attention.